Welcome to 5 Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Malcolm Bach. Malcolm is a runner, a coach, and a teacher of the Alexander Technique. He's also a cellist and a father of two based in Montreal, Quebec. Today we're going to be discussing the art of running, raising your performance with the Alexander Technique. I'm currently training for a marathon, so this was just the conversation that I needed. Let's ask him 5 Good Questions. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Malcolm Bach, author of The Art of Running. Hey, Malcolm, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Real pleasure. Uh, I have to say that I'm, this one is a bit of a personal, uh, a selfish episode for me, given that I'm training for a marathon right now. So this book was right on point for, for what I needed at the moment. Great, great. So you can give me all the credit if you, if you, set, your, uh, you set your goal there, I guess. Uh, it will be mostly, yeah, going yeah, away. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump right in. Question number one. Who was this guy, Alexander? And what is the Alexander technique that, that he came up with? Okay, Alexander. F.M. Alexander, as he was known, is uh, was an Australian actor and reciter. He would recite poetry and, and Shakespeare and stuff like that. We're talking about the late 1800s here, and um, he developed a serious voice problem. He'd lose his voice on stage. It was become hoarse. I guess it was trying to project his voice to the back of the back of the room. Put a lot of strain on it, and um, and it was threatening his career. So um, actor uh, doctors, you know, tried to help him. You know, gargle this, do this exercise, rest. Rest seemed to help, but as soon as he got back out on stage, and again, sort of had to, you know get into his act and, and, and get his voice working, it would break down. So he, he was stuck. He either had to kind of uh, change careers or in his case, he decided to try to figure out what, what, what the problem was, what was causing him to lose his voice on stage. And he, he managed to figure it out. It took him quite a while. Um, and he figured out it was how he was actually using himself when he tried to, when he tried to project his voice he was creating a lot of unnecessary tension in his body and his efforts to be dramatic. And uh, this was completely, he was completely unaware of this, as a matter of fact. He was just delivering the goods. He wasn't aware of really how he was doing it. And so along the way, he made some, um, some discoveries about um, how we can best organize ourselves in our activities so that we don't create a lot of unnecessary tension and strain in our, in our bodies um, when we're when we're reciting, as in his case, or um, you know, I work a lot with runners and musicians. Uh, oftentimes, you see people trying to play the violin and be very dramatic, and their neck is in a real knot, and their shoulders all twisted. Or, in the case of runners, we're trying to reach a goal or a target, and and we forget about how how we're, how to move well, and we start to strain and we start to force, and sometimes our bodies will break down, you know, along the way. So Alexander um, <clears throat> managed to cure his, himself of this voice problem, and and eventually people heard about what what he discovered because he would help his fellow actors a little bit along the way. Sure. And doctors started sending people from outside the the acting world who had a neck problem or a breathing problem or something. Alexander would get in there and say, "Well, you know, you're just doing this, so maybe I could help." You know. And pretty soon he started to develop a reputation as as the breathing man, people, somebody who could help people who'd had emphysema or breathing problems and other related things. Um, he was very effective at helping them, and a new career was born. And, and he eventually became known as the Alexander Technique. He moved to London in the uh, early 1900s, established a huge, very successful practice there, and eventually started training other people to teach what, what he called the work, what, what we now know it as the Alexander Technique. And um, I was very fortunate to train with one of the first people that he had trained back in 1931, uh, uh, a chap by the name of Patrick McDonald, who's sadly since, uh, since died. I think everybody that Alexander tra trained has died at this point. So we're now into a second or third generation. So, yeah. you know, I jokingly like to say that uh, Alexander was an 800 meter runner. Whenever I'm talking to runners, and that um, <laughs> he used to set the set the record local records in uh, Winyard, Tasmania, where he was from. He was known as the Tasmanian Devil of the Track. Anyway, that's just my take on it. We'll let the historical record uh, speak for itself. Um, anyway, that's that's where it all started. 
And now the Alexander technique is used a lot in the performing arts uh, with musicians and actors, dancers. And it's starting to become more known and more widely practiced in, in sports. Uh, so athletes who are, are looking to, um, you know, to improve their performance or get injured a bit less are now starting to have heard about it a little bit. Perhaps because of my book. Who knows? You know? <laughs> Could be. So, yeah. so as, what as is it, the Alexander Technique? You asked me that. Yeah. yeah. It, it's basically a, a, it's a method that helps people learn to recognize and, 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 and prevent unnecessary tension or interference in, in what they're doing so that they can perform any particular activity um, efficiently with, with the right amount of effort. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So you, you can sort of see the implications could, could range from helping people to stand or work better at their desk to learning how to play a musical instrument uh, more, more freely, which was, which was my first interest, uh, to, helping, to helping athletes uh, practice and, and, and uh, train um, in a way that isn't going <clears> to <throat> perhaps reduce the chances of it breaking down their bodies you know, in the process. You know? Right. So, <clears throat> question number two is around the idea uh, that you have in the book about an acronym of SMART running, S-M-A-R-T. Could you just quickly maybe walk us through what each one of those is for and, and kind of how it relates back to to having good running form and, and increasing your chances of success? Sure. Um, SMART running, what's well, an acronym and... Uh, See if I remember. Okay, smart. S. The S stands for skillful, and that um, it, it, it refers to the fact that although we're all born to run, everybody, unless you have some sort of neurological problem, can run. Um, you know, we can't all juggle and we can't all play the violin, but everybody on this planet can run. So it's it's a natural ability that we have. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody runs particularly well. Um, you know, if you watch. Uh, your next marathon and you see people sort of towards the back of the, you know, back of the tail end of it, you see some pretty funky running styles. I mean, it is running technically in the sense that they're, they're, they're getting both feet off the ground at some point, mm -hmm. but it certainly doesn't look like the, perhaps the people up at the front of the pack who just seem to flow. Yeah. They you know, just look it's like kind they're of, gliding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, at the back, it looks like they're just, uh, you know, shuffling or, you know, so, you know, it's the idea that running can be a skill, and like any skill, if you learn what what to practice and, and, and how to practice it, you can improve what you're doing to the level that you want to take it. So if you're a recreational runner and you just want to, you know, maybe get under that four-hour barrier um, in, in, the, uh, in the marathon, um, learning to be a bit more skillful in your movements will, will definitely um, support all the training and everything that you've done so that you're getting more bang for your buck yeah. As it were, out of, out of your investment, yeah? Right. So that's this S. Let's see. Um, M, mindful. Now, that's a, that's a word you hear a lot these days. And now, I wrote this book um, over 16 years ago, so but maybe I was a edition. bit of a trend. A bit ahead of my time there, but mindful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see a lot of runners these days, you know, they've got the headphones on, or if you go in the in the in the health club, they're on the, on the treadmill. They've got the vi you know they got the video. They got the their phone. They got the, <laughs> you know they're doing everything to kind of disconnect from what they're doing. You know, and and I I'm I'm sort of uh, you know this isn't it's in a religion, but I always think that running can be a great ex exercise in mindfulness, paying attention to what's what you what's going on in your body. What's, what you're thinking and what's going on around you so that you reconnect more fully with, with the activity and, and, and how you're participating in it. I mean, everybody's saying this is the, the path to happiness. Um, so why not practice it? Uh, my, my feeling is why not practice it when you're running? Hmm. Yeah. Um, SMA, um, athletic. Uh, a lot of runners, the way they move, it doesn't look very athletic. It looks, <laughs> <laughs> it sort of is a, a sport, but not, uh, um, and, and, and I'm not meaning, you know, how you look at the end of a marathon where everybody looks, you know, geez, that's when they always take the pictures of you, you know, when you're kind of, you're on fumes and you're just sort of crawling towards the finish line. Everybody who's run a marathon has, has been there, even the best. Right. You know, right. but I'm talking about when you're just fresh and you're out and you're running, you know, and, and you're feeling good and, 
and you're just looking like you know you're running on flat tires. Right. Now that's that kind of running form, if you want to call it a running style, can definitely be improved at all levels. You know, so I work with Olympians, and I've worked with people who are just beginning, people who are a bit overweight, people who are over sixty, over seventy. Uh, people with spinal problems like that, every one of them can run a little bit more athletically. That's something that you can learn how to do, you know? Yeah. And in terms of, uh, you know, how the Alexander Technique uh, relates to that, I, I didn't answer that part of your question, but one of the things about the Alexander Technique is we teach people how to actually have a lengthened spine. So in other words, how to run tall. Mm -hmm. Now, good runners, if you watch them, generally they seem to be pretty upright. There seems to be an upward direction in their body. And as it goes south, that <laughs> their head side seems to go, you know, the back sort of slumps a little bit, the shoulders kind of round. It's the typical sitting in front of the uh, computer posture that means so many people are, are fighting these days, right? Um, <clears throat> I often tell people you, you run like you sit, which I don't know if that's a great crowd pleaser, but there's a certain truth to it, you know? Um, so, yeah, so being more athletic starts with what's going on in your back, your, this head, neck, back relationship that Alexander found to be so important to his the health of his voice and what we found out since is is you know helps everybody perform whatever there is with with more poise and running is no exception so when your back is lengthening and your head's leading you run better yeah okay um r recreational now recreation refers to Recreating, and, and, and uh, I had a pretty good definition in the book of that. Can I? I'll just grab it here because it, it's an actual definition of what recreation actually means. Um, hold on here. Here we go. Recreational means a refreshment of one's mind or body after labor through diverting through diverted diverting activity, play. Now, I think for a lot of people, especially as you get more serious about it, running becomes a job. <laughs> right, <laughs> oh, I got to right. get my, you know, and I'm, we've all been guilty of this. I got to get my long run in, you know, you know, <laughs> but honey, I'm going into labor. Sorry, I got to get my long run in here. You know, I'll, I'll see you at the hospital. <laughs> you know, um, running, uh, you know, most of us are not professional athletes. We are never going to be Olympians. We're never going to make any money at running. It's just something we're doing for ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. Have, you know, clear the mind, come back a little bit more, uh, a little happier than we went out the door. But for many people, it just becomes all about time. What, what, you know, what, what, what kind of pace did you do your, your 400 repeats in? You know, how would you do on that? It's all about results and all the rest of it. It's not about what it actually should be, I think, for most recreational runners, which is, Re refreshing ourselves, rejuvenating ourselves, reconnecting with ourselves. Okay, that's the R part. And the last one, T, is transferable. So, the, you know, we, we talk about in the Alexander Technique of what might be called good posture. We, we talk about good use of ourselves, how, how to do things with an appropriate level of effort and energy, with a good attitude, um, you know, and... and um, you know, making sure that we dot the I's and cross the T's without being too compulsive about it all. Um, and so that's a skill that, you know, if you bring that to running, it helps you run better. But it's also transferable into other areas of your life. So that um, taking time to actually, I don't know, I've got a couple of young kids here, talk to your kids, you know, about their day and stuff like that and go, yes, thank you, dear. And then I'm sorry, I've got to update my Facebook page here, um, you know. Taking, taking care of the steps, taking care of yourself along the way, those are transferable skills. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's what we call smart running. Um, it doesn't mean you do all those things at all times, but they're nice things if you can incorporate some or all of those um, ideas into your running. I think not only will you be a better runner, you'll look prettier for the photos, um, <laughs> but you'll probably enjoy it for, uh, you know, for as long as you want to do it, which these days you can do it an awful long time. You know? One of the things for question number three that I liked about your book was that it was there were a lot of applications that I thought I could see make connections outside of just running necessarily. 
Um, one of them primarily being this idea of process versus results. A lot of really good investors that I, I follow, they put their process above the results a lot of times because they know there's sometimes you just can't control the outcome, but you can control your process. And so if you focus on that, you oftentimes end up with the result that you want anyway. But um, <clears throat> what? how do you put – how do you view that as, as far as process versus results go in such a uh, results-driven – field as running it seems to be like you said everyone has their times that they talk about or they just want to beat each, you know i was the fastest one today um and it's so easy to measure i think is maybe part of the the problem uh that that leads to results over process yeah well you're, you're talking to someone who just got his third garmin you know <laughs> <laughs> I, I got rid of the last one because it was giving me way too many sort of metrics you know it, it almost would tell me, you know, how long each burp I had was, you know, but how long my foot was on the ground, how long I was up in the air, a heart rate. I mean, just way overwhelmed yeah. with metrics. And if I was trying to pay attention to all those all the time, believe me, I, I, I would not really be enjoying the process, you know. And one of the nice things I remind myself, even if I feel a little bit sort of sometimes a little bit stiff and takes, you know, I find it takes a little bit longer to warm up, is that um, I feel really grateful that I can run every day, that I'm not injured, that I'm, that I'm healthy enough, um, that I have, you know, I live in an environment that allows me to run, um, you know, and, and I, you know, I'm extremely grateful about that, even as, as I say, if some days are a little bit harder than others, you know. Right. Um, so... Uh, I think that when it all gets down to results, it's kind of you lose really um, a lot of the richness that's involved in that activity. I mean, um, and, and, I, and I'm not criticizing anybody when I say this, but, you know, the fact that you went under, let's say, 42 minutes for 10K in the big picture doesn't mean anything nobody's going to be calling you to recruit you for their college team or ask you to come out for the Olympic squad or anything like that. I mean, in the big picture, uh, in a marathon, they go through 10K in 29 minutes in a marathon, okay? So when we look at it in terms of the big picture, yes, it's important that we all improve, that we all achieve our potential, but I think we have to kind of uh, sometimes look at it, you know, uh, put it put it. In, <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's got to have a context. It's got to sort of say this this is important, yes, but it's mm, it's it's in the world of running, it's not such a big deal. And then start to enjoy the stuff that that um, that is a big deal, which is the fact that you're healthy, that you're, you know, I think the two biggest principles in running, um, you know, for all runners are show up and keep going, you know, <laughs> and and those are kind of pretty good principles in life as well, you know. But, uh, you know, when it's a little cold or you're feeling a bit tired or, you know, whatever, um, you know, they say that when you don't want to want to run, any excuse will do. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but um, the fact that you've made, let's say, a commitment to get out there every day and run a mile every day um, <clears throat> and you show up and you do that, well, I can think of lots of other areas. That's kind of a useful, a useful thing to be able to do. So it's a good quality you're developing. The, the process of running, I mean – you know, we were talking about this earlier that, you, you know, you're training to, to reach a certain target time in your marathon. In your marathon and, um, you know, all, all things going well, you should be able to do it. But, as, you know, some days you may get up and there's a hurricane blowing and you realize that if you're running into a, a 30 mile an hour headwind, you're not going to achieve your goal. And you spent six months training for that day. You can't control the weather. So does that mean you've wasted the last six months of your life? Well, some people would say, well, geez, you didn't achieve your result. You know, you're a, you're a loser. I, I, I don't, you know, it, it, that's, that's silly. It's silly. You know, you've got yourself in really great shape. You've achieved the goal. You, you, you know, you've seen a lot of the, the country that you might not have seen if you didn't get out and run in it. Um, you know, you're probably a, a better person to get along with because you kind of leave a few of your demons out there on the trail instead of bringing them home. Um, you know, you're probably controlling your weight. Um, you might have learned how to become a better runner, so you move better. Um, you, you've got more awareness of your body and how it works, and, and you're in better connection with yourself. Lots of good things. So 
all that stuff, I think, sometimes gets lost in, in when we just focus on, on, on the goal, you know? But listen, goals, listen, I, I'm, I like goals. I was telling you earlier, <laughs> I chased trying to break, you know, 120 for the half marathon. I chased that for 10 years. I got within three one hundredths of a second. And, and the year I knew I was going to do it, we, we, had a, we had a hurricane, you know, the effects of a hurricane coming through here. And I knew as, as things were getting blown over on the course that shouldn't have been, shouldn't be able to move, that I wasn't going to do it on that day. And sadly, I didn't. But I, you know, I trained really hard. I'm quite proud of, of, of having put that time into it. From the Alexander point of view, Alexander really emphasized that um, if you take care of the means or the steps, the results will take care of themselves. It's still, you still need to have goals. You need to know where you're going, well, what you want, but then you need to sort of take time to really make sure that you're, you're in the moment. You're, you're, you're doing what needs to happen right now with your full attention, with mindfulness, with, with all that stuff. Yeah. That's a perfect uh, transition for question number four, which is, and this one, I'm, this is totally personally for me. Well, okay. what, uh, <laughs> What should my mantra or kind of my internal mental checklist while I'm running, what should I be telling myself? So I, I'll give you maybe what my mine is right now and you can tell okay, me yeah, what would improve great. it. Yeah. So okay. I think about uh, <clears throat> keeping my muscles loose and relaxed and, and trying to notice if there's anywhere where I feel like I'm extra tense and making it like, like w- w- uh, muscles opposing each other, let's say. Um, yeah. I think about trying to keep my, uh, and I probably, I think I stole this one from the book, but having like basically something tied to my sternum and p- pulling it up at like a 45 degree angle from my sternum. And so pulling my chest kind of up and, and forward and keeping my head elevated. Um, what else? Trying to run quietly is the other thing in my head. Um, I know, I think that, that that will probably be less energy used over the that same time uh, distance if it's done at a quieter, um, and then also landing like midfoot basically and not heel striking. So that's kind yeah. of my checklist while I'm, wow. running, but, uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, what Pretty else good. am I, what else am I missing? Well, um, you know, in learning, they talk about taking a lot of ideas and then bringing them together into chunks mm-hmm. so that you're not, uh, dealing with all the bits and pieces. You're getting to them to the point where they're just a chunk. Right. And then you can put chunks together, which have lots of, right? And it, you, so you can put more information together at one time. And, and apparently we're able to deal with chunks, um, you know, quite, quite nicely. So um, I try to chunk a lot of those things that you, you've talked about, you know, the landing, um, uh, free muscles. So like I try to put it into one chunk, which I just think about flow. So, uh, you know, so for me, flow, if I'm pounding the ground, I'm not flowing. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I feel um, a jerky in my body, I'm not flowing. If I feel tight anywhere in my body, I'm not flowing. Um, <clears throat> if, I'm, if I'm pushing myself too hard so that my, uh, you know, I'm out of my breathing rhythm, I'm not flowing. Mm-hmm. So th- there's all sorts of things that are equal not flowing. So when I stop all those things, I'm in that <laughs> flow state. So <laughs> and, and I try to come back to that on, on every run. So I've been running now for over, over 40 years. And, um, um, you know, <clears throat> I can tell you, you have good days and you have bad days. Some days it's easy. Some days... You know, you feel like, geez, I'm, I'm running like a Kenyan today, you know. And some days you get out there and it's like, have I ever run before? What's wrong? <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah, I, on every one of those days, my sort of uh, almost unconscious goal at this point is get to the point where you're flowing. So it might mean paying attention to some of those things that you've talked about, like if I'm, you know, Maybe I had one too many beers last night and I'm getting up and I'm feeling a little down. So I said, I said okay, come on. <laughs> where's, where's that upward direction today? You know, let's find a little bit more of that. Depends on what you need to work on on the day. Mm-hmm. But for me, flow is a, is a pretty good chunk. You can put a lot of, a lot of stuff into that one. Yeah? Perfect. I'll, I'm going to use that. Uh, so question number five. Uh, what's the connection that I've seen – multiple people mentioned, but between running and kind of deeper thinking exercises like 
like reading actually. Yeah, I know that was the, that was the toughest question. I, you know, um, and, and I had to stop and think about that a little bit. Um, but if, if you think about how, I mean, reading trends these days, how reading has now become, you know, um, like one-liners, you know, to actually sit down and read a book from cover to cover. I don't know how much people do that anymore. You know, you're scanning headlines all the time. There's, there's um, do you know what I mean? It, it, it's sort sure. of, there's not, a, there's not a, a sense of getting, a, a, you know, getting into an author if you're reading so, fiction and, 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 and stuff that I think was quite common practice before sort of modern media trends. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, but when you do that, you, you get into the depth of it. You get into um, a, another world. You get, you, know, you get somewhere that you wouldn't have got otherwise with, with that kind of, you know, the kind of focus and presence and um, persistence that it takes to actually be there and get into a book and into, into any sort of level. And the same thing goes, I think, for, um, you know, with running. When you're running really well, um, I always wonder about people who are listening to music and stuff like that because I find that when I'm running really well, every part of me is focused on what's going on. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm very aware of what's going on in my body. A lot of the things that you talked about before, you know, what's the quality of the landing? You know, is there tension in my body? Do I feel like I'm, I'm moving well? Um, you know, if it's a race, am I hitting some? Am I hitting my splits? Um, if it's going poorly, how am I managing that in myself? You know, am I, am I able to kind of get through rough spots? You know, um, <clears throat> all that sort of stuff. Am I aware of my surroundings? Am I connecting? Do I hear, do I hear or see things that are going on around me? That takes a tremendous, that takes my focus. I can be completely in that little bubble um, when I'm running well. When I'm not running well, I'm distracted. Mm. Little things bug me. Um, I can't get into the flow state. I'm, you know, uh, I'll, you know, I'm looking for a way out. Right. And I find out when I'm reading these days, sometimes I can't get into a book. I'm sort of, uh, okay, just let me just check to see if I got an email here. Or just, oh, I'll just go. And, I, and I, I just can't get into the state that I need to be in to really benefit from, from the book or from, from the experience. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. So one of the bonus questions we always ask is for a book recommendation. And, yes. and uh, what do you have for us today? Well, um, I, I had um, actually I have two, and they're both sort of <laughs> um, uh, related to a lot of what we've been talking about. I, you know, mm-hmm. um, the, the the one that I, the, the one that I've read most recently is called um, "The Art of Learning." And it's 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 a really good book. I mean, as as a writer, I, I really appreciate so much how the author, who was a, a sort of a boyhood chess uh, champion, it, it, it's the author. Uh, it's the guy who was in the film um, "Searching for Bobby Fischer." Yeah, it's, uh, if, uh, Josh, Josh Waitzkin. That's it. Yeah. That's the guy. You know, he moved from being a chess champion to a Tai Chi champion, you know, uh-huh. but natural transition in my mind. But um, um, and he's able to write about the quality of learning and the quality of the le- and the learning experience. He's able to articulate that in a way which has me, you know, brings tears to my little beady eyes because I wish I could write that well. Now, maybe he didn't write it. Maybe somebody did. But whoever wrote it, boy, are they ever good, you know. <laughs> And, and for anybody who who's enjoys learning and, and enjoys the process of getting into the depth of things, getting to the truth of things um, to the point where they're no longer ideas but things that you live and who you are, boy, is that a great book. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty exciting as well. Um, I mean, he toots his own horn a little bit, but maybe if you're a world champion, you know, you, you've, got, you've got bragging rights. <laughs> Go for it. But I think it's a very, very good book. I was, I was in New York um, last weekend, and I didn't have time, but I'd like to go look him up and say, hey, Josh, show me how you got from here to here and what, what the learning process is. I don't know if you can give me the time of day, but um, I, I actually wanted to go and talk to him about, about learning. And um, 
and how you translate that into his body. I'm very interested in translating ideas into body, as you might have guessed. Yeah. Well, Malcolm, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share all this with us. It's yeah. It's uh, I just feel like I'm just getting started. But thank you for, uh, <laughs> for having me on your show. It's it's great, and uh, um, I'd like to wish you a lot of luck in your process and in your results. <clears throat> nice to get both. Uh, for your upcoming marathon. <laughs> I appreciate that. I think I'm going to go for a run right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to 5GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks. Happy reading. <laughs>